All right, um, this is a topic close to my heart and I'll show you why. That's why. That is not a fashionable nose, let's face it. And I struggled with that. When I was a teen, I was doing all sorts of stuff like trying to cover this little bump to see if it looks better or wondering if I keep pushing on this bump, will it make it smaller? It took a lot of unlearning to realize that this is my nose, this is what makes me me. It looks like my dad's nose, it looks like my grandma's nose, it looks like probably a lot of my ancestors. And it's not a bad thing. In fact, I have now come to the conclusion that have I ever had a nose job? It would probably not look good. But there is a lot of pressure whenever something doesn't necessarily look like what people think it should look. And I feel like part of this unlearning experience for me was realizing that it's all temporary trends. Back in 19th century, my nose would most likely be considered fashionable. So it took some realizing that my nose is a trend. <laughs> Noses are a trend too. I'm sure you've all heard about buccal fat removal recently. Basically it's a procedure in which you remove a portion of fat tissue from your cheeks to get those like snatched cheekbones. <laughs> and while it's gaining more and more attention online, all I can think about is one particular thing. The mid to late 2000s models. Thank you to Disney Image Blitz for sponsoring today's video. You can download the game on your mobile device or tablet for free using the link in the description. What game? Here is what it's all about, baby. Disney Emoji Blitz is a match 3 game, but not your regular match 3 game. Each emoji you play with has a unique power-up, so you can choose between those emojis based on what strategy you currently feel like taking. One of the fun things about the game is that the more you play, the more you expand your emoji collection, and there is a lot to choose from, practically every Disney character you can think of is either already there or is going to be there. Not to mention Star Wars and Pixar characters and as I mentioned there's new characters being added every week and every month. There's also villain emojis of famous villains. They just released new Mandalorian emojis last month and because Disney is celebrating their 100th anniversary this year you also get special emojis related to that. Also when you collect emojis you can send them to your friends. Now me being me of course I'm trying to spot all things historical. So, so far my favorite emoji is Elizabeth Swan from Pirates of Caribbean in her 18th century style updo. But I'll keep you posted when I discover more historically inspired emojis. Anyway, go ahead and download the game for free using the link in the description and you can play it on your mobile device or your tablet. Back to the video! Basically, in my early teens, I was a kid that was very much into fashion. I couldn't afford fashionable clothes, but I was interested in what they look like. And my mom, knowing that, would sometimes buy me ridiculously overpriced imported Teen Vogue magazines. <laughs> Not only that, but I was also obsessed with fashion TV. Back when YouTube was primarily low quality cat videos and people doing music covers in their basement, fashion TV was the only place where, at least that was available in Poland, where you could practically watch non-stop fashion shows. So because of that, I feel like as an early teen, I was very much in touch with the beauty standard in fashion back then. And something that I've noticed, that of course was not a feature that all of the models had, but a large chunk of 2000 supermodels had that look. And that was a round doll-like face. Models like Gemma Ward, Lily Cole, Ali Michael, Devon Aoki, Jessica Stam, even to some degree models like Natalia Vodianova or Chanel Iman, represented that ethereal, round-faced look. Now you might argue that it used to be the high fashion trend and buckle fat removal is more of a mainstream or entertainment industry trend, but let's remember that Bella Hadid most likely had one and is generally considered one of the most famous supermodels of our time. So it's safe to say there is an analogy there. Seeing trends like the buckle fat removal making round-faced people insecure when doll face was an absolute staple of fashion not even 15 years ago is absolutely wild. <laughs> Another case, we all remember when the BBL or the Brazilian butt lift craze started. Pioneered by the Kardashians, it became one of the most recognizable plastic surgery procedures. Transferring fat from your abdomen to achieve that perfect round bottom. 
Anyone with a flat ass, me included, <laughs> instantly felt like there was something wrong with them, like they were lacking. And anyone with a naturally big bottom, on the other hand, wondered how something they were mocked for their entire lives is suddenly something that is coveted. So people saved up for surgeries, traveled abroad, endured a really invasive procedure, because let's face it, BBL, BBL recovery is super tough. To the point there are now recovery clinics that offer 24-7 nurse assistance. They're available just for that purpose, just for people after BBL. That's how big of an issue recovery is. And then eight years later, unnatural looking round bottoms are just no longer trending. The Kardashians have removed their implanted tissue. It looks like she removed the top portion of her butt. It sounds really weird but it looks like she removed that portion. Magazines are reporting there is a new, more desirable butt shape that is trending right now. It's wild. How come a butt, how are butts a trend? Another example, admittedly a milder one. Stars like Doja Cat and Bella Hadid are currently sporting thin eyebrows. While it's not really the 2000s level of thin eyebrows yet, I can bet thin eyebrows will be making a massive comeback in a matter of a couple of years, months, weeks. Just like back in 2015, when everyone was suddenly into those thick, dark, angular brows that make us cringe nowadays. Funnily enough, I did some research because I was like, that wasn't that long ago. Like, I remember that. Back in 2015, we cringe at thin eyebrows just as much. On December 16, 2015, an article on BeBeautiful.in noted, last year marked the year of bold, bushy brows. It gave women the courage to say goodbye to tweezers. A Huffington Post article about the hottest eyebrow trends for 2015 pleaded, never ever plaque your eyebrows. <laughs> in 2018, Rihanna graced the cover of Vogue with a probably fake but plucked eyebrow look that sparked instant backlash. <laughs> People on Twitter complained things we're absolutely not doing, letting tiny pencil thin eyebrows make even a whisper of a societal comeback. Resist. That was 2018. It's 2023. I feel like it's more than a whisper at this point. Racked wrote, please don't run out and plaque your brows into oblivion. If you're curious to see what you look like, spoiler, you won't look like Rihanna, try the glue stick technique long lost by the theatrical and drag queen communities to cover up your real brows. Then pencil to your heart's content, Instagram it, and wash it all off. Well, look at it now. So how come we plucked our eyebrows to oblivion back in the 2000s, then laughed at thin eyebrows for years, and now we're bullying anyone who's sticking to the 2016 eyebrow routine as if they're somehow inferior to anyone that's following the trends. How come round faces were all the rage merely 15 years ago and are now a reason people are surgically enhancing them? How come we were obsessing with thigh gaps back in 2013 and now a purse-shaped silhouette with thick thighs is the one considered desirable. Well, that's because, ladies and gentle folk, just like clothes or hair or makeup, body parts are fashion. And fashion, as we all know, is ever-changing. It changes fast and it's very unforgiving to anyone who doesn't follow it closely. When I made my video about beauty standards, some argued that our taste in what we consider beautiful is rooted in biology. We praise symmetry and youth because it supposedly biologically makes sense for us to desire those features. Except it doesn't always work like that. <laughs> I personally don't agree. Like sure, there probably are some hormonal and biological desires that are naturally implanted in our brain, but if it was like that, we wouldn't feel the constant need to change our appearance. We do feel that because again, body parts are fashion. Let's rewind a little bit. Has it always been like that? When you read historical descriptions of women, there's a lot of details and at the same time not much. <laughs> While we get descriptions of the precise features that were considered attractive, such as eyes or lips or let's not mince our words here, boobs, <laughs> the descriptions themselves are rather vague. Let me tell you what I mean. Geoffrey of Vinsa's Poetria Nova from the 13th century describes female beauty as such. Let the face be like the dawn, neither rosy nor white but of both <laughs> and neither color at the same time. My guy, this is telling me nothing. Um, I still don't know what you like. In a 14th century romance, Guy of Warwick, his love interest is described as having brows bent 
and nose well sitting, her body well set and shapely. You must admit, this is not a very precise description and a rather vague beauty standard. It's like whatever he found attractive. In his Divine Comedy, Dante describes Beatrice as having eyes of light more bright than any star, which is lovely, but doesn't really tell us anything about what she looks like. When you look at later literary examples, they usually follow the same pattern. What this is telling me is that certain kinds of features were considered desirable, but literature mostly underlines the overall appeal of a person. Like someone's eye shape was intriguing, or someone's forehead charming, or someone's hands perfectly formed, or someone's countenance joyous, but the literary descriptions don't necessarily promote a single nose type that we should all find beautiful. Same with beauty books, especially in the 19th century, people were obsessed with beauty books, there are so many. These were all sorts of books that instructed on how to achieve the perfect beauty. These books should obviously be taken with a massive grain of salt because first of all a lot of them were written by men and second of all they all contain a lot of questionable medical knowledge <laughs> like freckles being pieces of iron that floated to the surface of your skin or your uterus being held loosely and therefore prone to falling out. And thirdly, those were personal, most often very subjective opinions of the authors. So by no means a good mirror of beauty standards of the era. I'm gonna have to adjust the settings on my camera because it's getting dark. <laughs> like, give me a second. Okay, done. But those books do offer some insight into, into the way beauty was perceived back then. And the more beauty books I read, the more I can't help but go, wow, these aged really badly. And it's not even about the fact that they're mostly racist and misogynistic, but also because all the descriptions of body parts that were fashionable back then, or things that people were desperately trying to avoid and get rid of, is completely the opposite of what we want nowadays. Just listen to this advice from 1897 on how to make one's nose bigger. The small nose may be increased in size by gentle and repeated friction with the aromatic tincture. It may be lengthened by frequent pulling. The nostrils, if too narrow, may be widened by inserting in them small pieces of the fine sponge used in surgical operations which swelling with the moisture will insensibly dilate the cavities. I don't, I don't think I've ever heard about anyone who went like, my nostrils are so small. <laughs> Speaking of small noses, this booklet from, uh, I can't remember the date, so I'm just gonna put it here. Considered small noses inelegant. It described the comic snub nose to that which the French call retrousse, slightly curved inward and turned up appropriate to the liveliness of the soubrette, but not to the highest elegance and nobility of the female face. So basically they were like, if you have a small nose, you look like a child and are therefore not elegant enough. So you better try pinching that nose baby to make it look longer. <laughs> On freckles back in 1890, freckles are great destroyers of one's peace of mind as well as of one's beauty. Freckles are the most obstinate of all blemishes and are what may be termed incurable. Let me remind you that in 2023, people tattoo fake freckles. People use henna to fake freckles. People spray fake freckles onto their faces. The duality of those two approaches is absolutely insane. Now listen to this one, which brings me full circle to how I started this video. This one is from, again, I don't remember the date, so I'm just gonna put it here when I, when I, sprawdze, when I check it. Excessive thinness, while not necessarily incompatible with health, is a greater foe to beauty than even excessive corpulence. The outlines of the face and of the figure in this condition of the body lose the roundness. The eyes become sunken, the cheeks fall. It's literally like, <laughs> beware, if you're thin, you might have cheekbones showing and it's not a good look. Now I'm not going to quote this whole paragraph directly because it's basically the author trying to prove that other races than white and other cultures than Western have no appreciation of beauty because they never experienced beauty 
and do not know beauty because they haven't been exposed to it by the colonizers, which of course is not only blatant white supremacy, but it also shows that the author is completely oblivious to the fact that beauty is not in fact objective and beauty standards change rather rapidly over time. And little did he know that when we, he was trying to belittle Africans for considering big bottoms beautiful, in some places in Africa the most beautiful female form is considered that in which the posterior is monstrously developed, he was actually straight up describing the Brazilian butt lift. But let's talk about race actually, because I feel like we cannot separate beauty ideals from race. I mentioned the doll face models of the 2000s, but you must have noticed how most of them were white and blonde. And so the vast majority of models at the time. With the rise of women in color in the entertainment industry and with the growing societal expectation of the media actually reflecting the diversity of the world that we live in, beauty ideals started shifting. Now, don't get me wrong, it's great that the beauty standards are diversifying. Women of color deserve to feel beautiful without being fetishized. And I'm hoping we're long past considering whiteness a staple, the only staple of beauty. I'm just saying, <laughs> the line between appreciation of those features and appropriation of those features is honestly growing thin. And I don't feel like it's my place to delve into the topic further. It's like, I know nothing about it, but I just wanted to know that while possibly mainstream beauty standards that we see presented in the media are more diverse than ever, it also makes total sense that people and minorities that were bullied, shamed, and ridiculed for those same features have mixed feelings about this. Because when body parts are fashion, so are the original owners of those body parts and they usually haven't consented to being items of fashion in the first place. Speaking of which, big lips are a prime example of body parts being fashion. Lips were of course always part of a beauty standard, starting from vague descriptions of kissable red lips to cupid bow being considered desirable. We went from natural to underlined to natural to overlined to natural to overlined to natural to overlined and now to lip filler. Now again, I don't want to shame anyone that has lip fillers. There is a lot of you probably watching, but also you have to take into account that the lip fashion might completely sway in another direction, just like the eyebrows did. Another procedure that I feel like 90% of <laughs> female celebrities have done during the 2020 lockdown mostly because they knew they would have time to recover is actually two procedures. It's the brow lift and blepharoplasty. Again, why is this fashion? I don't... Why is the removal of eyelid skin a trend? Why is the placement of the brow a matter of fashion? We went from vague descriptions like her eyebrows worked with her face nicely to this surgery will raise your eyebrow to a position that is currently considered to be meeting beauty standards. Or I know your droopy eyelid is the most charming thing about you, but it's kind of lame nowadays, so let's cut this thing out. But also, if we're speaking about plastic surgery to conform to body parts being fashion. We also need to mention that women honestly just can't win. I just saw this YouTube short about Amelia Clark. Amelia Clark is one of the most beautiful people on the planet, but now she's being insulted heavily online with people calling her too old. The war began was when she posted this photo right here on Twitter, which went viral with people noticing how different Amelia Clark looked. It is shocking for some people to realize, but it has been 14 years since Amelia Clark hit major media. She is now 36 years old, so naturally she's aged. Amelia Clark seems to be one of those actresses that embraces her wrinkles. And look how it's being received. If she doesn't conform to the societal expectations of what a woman her age should look like, she gets dissed for looking old. If she does conform and invest in Botox, lip filler, and a brow lift, she will get picked on for getting work done and looking like everyone else. And of course, this custom of criticizing women for practically anything regarding their appearance goes way back. This one's from 1513. Haven't you noticed how much prettier a woman is? If when she makes up, she does so with so little that those who see her cannot tell whether she is made up or not. But others are so bedobed that it looks like they are wearing a mask and they're not laugh because they fear it will crack. Bombastic side eye. Criminal offensive side eye. How much nicer it is to see a woman, a good looking one I mean, who obviously has nothing on her face, neither white nor red, 
but just her natural color, whose gestures are simple and natural without working at being beautiful. 1897. The mistake sometimes but rarely committed by men, but frequently by women, is in attempting by dress and other devices to look younger than they really are. If such could only be brought to realize that no devices are possible to conceal the changes of time, they would save themselves much labor and mortification. Bruh. But honestly, who can blame them if back in 1845 this is how middle-aged women were described? When women pass happily from the third to the fourth age, their constitution, as everyone must have observed, changes entirely. Beauty, however, is no more. Form and shape have disappeared. The plumpness which supported the reliefs has abandoned them. The sinkings and wrinkles are multiplied. The skin has lost its polish. Color and freshness have fled forever. Um, excuse me, what's the actual f Here are some quotes about eyebrows. If the eyebrows are too thick or are badly shaped, they can be thinned and trained to the line of beauty by the use of the tweezers or of a depilatory and patient manipulation. If they are thin, there are various methods of stimulating their growth. If they are too light, they may be darkened by a decoction of walnut juice. And a very precise description of lips as well, which tells you nothing. The upper lip should be short and less full than the lower one. Both should be neither distinctly full nor thin. Too much fullness gives an effect of grossness and too little of pinched meanness. Funnily enough, a common theme you probably have noticed in those 19th and early 20th century beauty books is that everything needs to be natural. Like we will judge you if you're naturally ugly, but if you try too hard to change that and we notice that you tried, we will judge you even harder. You will only get praised if you naturally possess those features or if you didn't have to work too hard to bring them out. And this again is something that we totally hear till this day. We expect women to maintain a certain level of beauty or we call them frumpy, but God forbid they try too hard and they're instantly ridiculed. I think a good example is Lady Gaga at the Oscars this year. First she got criticized for a gown that was too revealing and wearing makeup that was like too strong and then when she appeared on stage in a t-shirt and makeup less, everyone started making memes about her chappy lips. So do you want natural or not? What is going on here? Also, is there even such a thing as a natural woman? There is a lot of discourse online about guys complaining that girls wear too much makeup, but when you actually try and ask them if they think someone is wearing makeup or not, it turns out they have no idea. They only notice when it's like really strong. If a woman is not supposed to wear makeup, then is washing your face okay with a certain gel or is gel considered makeup? Is only soap okay? Only water? And if gel is okay, is moisturizer fine? Because, you know, your face is naturally dry, so maybe you should leave it all natural. Doesn't it mean you're interfering with its natural state? And in the context of body parts being fashion, what is natural? And do people complaining about fake features really value natural? Will a guy complaining about someone's lip fillers compliment a girl's thin lips? I don't think so. Apart from the societal pressure to constantly conform to the current standards of how your body parts look, there is of course the natural desire to have what you cannot have. One of the things the beauty and hygiene book from I think 1897 got right was those who are decidedly thin naturally wish to gain flesh, those who are too stout to lose it. I mean, if you have straight hair, you probably at some point dreamed of it being curly. And if you have curly hair, you may or may not have completely burned it with a straightener at some point. But when you really think about it, was it because you really wanted a change? Or was it because you had straight hair in the 80s or curly hair in the 2000s and it just was not meeting the trend at the time? How much of it was influenced by a particular hair type being fashionable? Anyway, you may have noticed that throughout this video I have focused solely on female features and female beauty standards and there's a big reason for this. Men are for some reason exempt from the pressure of most beauty standards when it comes to certain body parts and features. This is a topic for a whole separate video but let's just say this men's beauty is definitely not undergoing the same scrutiny. There are certain elements of it that can definitely be blamed on societal pressure, such as hair pattern, jaw shape, or being the right height and the right weight and 
being in shape in general, but men are far more likely to be considered attractive even when their looks are unconventional. A good example of that is the current obsession with Pedro Pascal. Now don't get me wrong, I think he's a great actor, he's definitely handsome and good looking, but <laughs> it goes without saying I think that the reason we all find him attractive is mainly his charisma. It doesn't matter to us that he's graying, that he's got wrinkles, his neck skin shows his age basically. If he passed you on the street and you didn't know who he was, you'll probably just see him for who he is, like a good-looking middle-aged guy. It's similar with a lot of male actors. George Clooney, Brad Pitt, Idris Elba, Chris Pine. I may be wrong, but for the time being, I cannot imagine a graying, wrinkled female actress the same age triggering this sort of reaction and suddenly becoming a sex symbol. I just don't see it. I'll be honest, with male celebrities, I don't see particular body parts being fashion. Apart from the fact that they need to be moderately in shape. But when they're not, we're calling it dad bod. When you look at male celebrities, there is a variety of nose types, lips ranging from full to non-existent, face shapes going from round to more chiseled, really full brows and those barely visible, protruding eyes, deep set eyes, head full of hair, bald head. It seems that ethnic noses and ethnic features in general are also a lot more acceptable on males. Now a disclaimer to think that the male celebrities are all natural is also completely naive. <laughs> Not only the majority of male actors use steroids to gain this sporty physique, they also do hair implants quite a lot, jaw implants and Botox on a regular. The fact that we don't notice that is mostly because we don't put them under the same scrutiny as female actresses and it only comes to our attention when it's done wrong. My overall conclusion is thus. Yes, body parts have always been a part of fashion in some way or the other. What has drastically changed, however, is that first of all, the guidelines as to what is fashionable were always rather lax. Like when you look at photos of famous 19th century women considered beautiful at the time, it's not only completely different types of looks, but also I'm gonna be honest with you, they don't look that spectacular uh, when you compare the photo to really poetic descriptions of people that knew those women. And that's most likely because back then a massive factor of beauty was how they carried themselves and their voice, their character and their manners, their posture even. Nowadays it seems like not only is beauty reduced to purely visuals, what we can see in photographs and video, but it also seems like there is often one particular nose type or lip shape that is fashionable and it's also usually a shape few possess naturally. Because of beauty standards regarding certain body parts being so strict and narrow, a lot of people feel constant pressure to look a certain way or else they would not be considered beautiful. And also, we now have a massive industry benefiting from such pressure. No shade towards plastic surgeons, but if you ever go to one, do you think they'll tell you, oh, your nose is fine? No, they will most likely say that after your nose job, your chin might look a little disproportionate, so you might as well do that. And then those eyelids of yours might soon start drooping, so you might take a little of that eyelid skin out as well while you're at it. And I mean, I'm not getting into the ethics of plastic surgery. I'm sure there's a lot of professionals out there that truly want the best for their patients and whose life mission is to give people confidence that they need. But when so much money is at stake, and let's face it, those procedures are all really expensive, there will be a lot of people who understand that they benefit from people's insecurities and most of all they profit from body parts being fashion. Because fashion is always changing and in a couple of years those features that they are helping people get will be out of fashion and those clients will be back. So next time you, like me one day, worry about your nose not necessarily being fashionable. Just give it five years, honestly. <laughs> yeah. That's my rant for today. Bye.